Hello, welcome to AR and AR. I'm Adam Rose, without a hat this time. And today I'm going to be talking about sleep strategy. It's a really important topic and sleep deprivation itself is probably one of the more intimidating factors about longer adventure races, especially for newcomers. Okay, sleep strategy. Uh, just quickly to answer why I'm not wearing a hat, it's because finally after three and a half years of living in a pretty cold house, we got central heating, so woohoo! Anyway, just to answer that question. All right, now, sleep strategy is a big topic, and the question really is, how much do you need? And I'm gonna say, in one word, it depends. Oh, it's two words. It depends, 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 depends. So there are many factors that, go that are gonna govern your sleep strategy. And probably the most important one is the length of the race. So to break it down quickly, for a short race, which I uh, classify as something 24 hours or less, my response is don't sleep. You don't need it. You might get tired, you might be exhausted even, but that race is too short to bother sleeping. Uh, the adrenaline is high, you're running fast, you're moving fast, um, you'll be running more often than you would be trekking. And so with all that energy, you haven't got time to waste, and it's a very fast pace. So you can always sleep afterwards, you can recover afterwards. Uh, if you feel really tired, take some caffeine tablets, and that'll probably be enough, or some magnesium, vitamin B, something like that. Then you get the kind of mid-length races. So, you know, something maybe 36 hours long, 48 hours long, maybe even 60 hours long. Um, yeah, you probably will need some sleep. Um, it's going to come down to how experienced you are. But uh, in my experience anyway, nowadays in a 60 hour race, probably wouldn't need more than a couple of hours, maybe even get away with an hour. As a less experienced team, yeah, you might be getting four or five hours, something like that. But you can quite easily do a race that length. Um, you will go through very bad patches, no doubt, from the lack of sleep. It's still a fairly, you know, pushing yourself pretty hard, pretty fast. Um, but you can do without um, anything more than two hours, I'd say. And then you get longer races. So now we start talking 72 hours and longer. And for those races, you do need a sleep strategy. You can't go without sleep or really shouldn't. Um, and it'll just come back to bite you if you try and push the envelope too hard. Okay, so that's, that's a kind of broad classification. Now, uh, in terms of pushing the envelope, um, going without sleep can pay dividends. And I'm going to tell you what is commonly seen as a truth, however illogical it sounds. But the faster teams, the teams at the front of the pack, who are therefore probably not getting much sleep, have an easier time. Now, that's not because they're on the course for a shorter length of time. I'm just saying it's a weird, weird thing in the atmosphere, weird thing in the ether, that the fastest teams have less weather issues. They have less problems. They have less trouble in the race. It's just something that happens and you can ask experienced teams and it just is true. Um, and it's not to do with, you know, late comers or, or slower teams going along a course that's been torn up by the teams in front. This isn't an ultra marathon. You don't have everybody going on the same track. Therefore, you don't usually suffer from torn up ground and things like that. So it's simply a weird factor. If you go without sleep and push yourself harder and go faster, you will have, it seems, less trouble on the course from external factors. Now, the flip side of that is, if you push it too hard, things can go seriously wrong. Um, and a simple way to explain that is, for example, if you're doing a mountain bike stage and you decide to sleep involuntarily, as you can imagine, it can only end badly. So you really wanna be wise in how you plan your sleep strategy. Okay, then the question becomes, when should you sleep? Now, ironically, especially for newcomers, you shouldn't always try and sleep at night. Now, there are gonna be a number of criteria that you have to evaluate as to when will be the best time. But, um, for example, something that might encourage me to take a sleep at night might be if the terrain's very hostile. So it's hard underfoot, maybe going down a riverbed, you're going very slowly because it's so hard underfoot, and you know it could even be dangerous, tricky terrain. 
So then you might say, well, look, it's, it's night time. Let's just call it quits. Let's get a, a half an hour, a couple of hours even undercover. And then at dawn, we're refreshed. We can make better progress, make faster progress. So that's one factor, difficulty of terrain. Another one might be the weather. And you know, if the weather gets bad, uh, obviously you might be suffering, it might be cold. I would say if the weather gets bad, it's worth stopping to sleep at night if you can get undercover. So that might be a building, it might be uh, a, a cave, a rocky ledge, something like that, anywhere where you can get out of the elements. Then I might say, well, sleeping at night might be a good idea. And uh, it can, you know, maybe you can hope that the weather will improve, that you get a little respite from those bad, the bad elements. And, you know, again, at dawn, you're feeling slightly better, you can continue. So if you can get cover. Now, the flip side of that is, if it's at night, terrible weather's coming along, and you don't have the means to protect yourself from that weather, then I would say it's probably not a good idea to sleep at night. So, because, you know, when you stop moving, your body temperature is going to drop, you're not exercising as hard, well, you're not anymore, and so you could, you know, get really cold, you could even suffer hypothermia, something like that. So, um, if you in an area or you don't have the kit with you, not all expedition races or even uh, mid-length races will require you to carry a sleeping bag and a tent, uh, certainly not necessarily the entire length of the race, just mountain stages. So. If you're in a bad situation, I would say it's probably better not to sleep at night and to push through, stay warm by, by, by literally by the movement, um, and then maybe in the daytime, uh, then take a break at that time. And thirdly, of course, navigation. Obviously, at night, navigation will always be harder because you can't see as far, you can't see the mountains, you can't see uh, land features and things like that. So that might be another reason, especially if you've gotten lost or you're not sure where you are. You might say, okay, let's just, again, Pull over to one side, take a break, get out, go to sleep, and you know when we can see better, we'll move better, we'll move faster. So those would all be good arguments in favor, potentially, of sleeping at night. But the reason why it might be good to sleep in the day is literally, it's easier to sleep in the day. At night, the temperature is generally lower, so the sleep that you're going to get will be affected by those low temperatures. And at night, because it's colder, you might, uh, well, you probably have to take out your tent, you have to take out your sleeping bag. So let's say you're actually going to sleep for just 20 minutes. To get out a tent and put it up and get into a sleeping bag, all for 20 minutes worth of sleep, is quite a bother. It's quite a faff. You're going to waste time. Whereas if you decide to take that sleep in the middle of the day, where no doubt it's going to be warmer, you don't need to take the tent out. You don't need to take the sleeping bag out. So you could literally pull over to the side of the road, lie down on some grass, go to sleep instantly, and have the same duration of sleep, the same 20 minutes, but without the bother, um, and therefore have a much better quality of sleep and be more refreshed. So even though other teams are still pushing during the day and moving quite fast during the day, it might be a wiser strategy to sleep in the day and travel hard at night. In the 2009 Adventure Racing World Championships in Portugal, the British team Heli Hansen Prinesco ended up winning the race. They were, you know, towards the front of the field, obviously doing very well, but it's a long race, tough race, and they were exhausted. So towards the end of the race, they reached a point where they were, they were falling apart through lack of sleep. And they found a barn and they set their stopwatches at, or their alarm clocks at two hours. So, you know, let's get two hours, Kip, recover a bit, and then we can try to keep ahead of the pack. Unfortunately, they, they were so tired, they slept through the alarm clock. So they woke up after four hours. And they had thought they lost the race because, you know, the competing teams, including Team Nike with Chris Fawn, of all people, had overtaken them. Now, ironically, oversleeping, spending too much time or more time than they expected or planned, actually paid off in the long term because they ended up having, well, recovering better, being more refreshed, and were therefore able to navigate and push harder at the very end of the race and overtake uh, the competing teams, and that's how they managed to win. So, you know, sometimes playing that wiser game is going to pay dividends. And... In their case, it was an accident, really. But if you look at Team Avaya, as you all know, number one, formerly Team Seagate, um, they, for a long time, had a strategy of looking after themselves in the expedition races. So, you know, they, they play their own game. they obviously competing against the other teams, but they are competing against the course, and they're very careful to look after themselves. So they'll take sleep maybe sooner than other teams might, and they, they can, their strategy is kind of 
to bank two hours of sleep every night if they can. And uh, you know, a lot of uh, other teams, podium level teams, might try to push hard instead to, to get to the front. But by taking a measured amount and a good amount of sleep, it pays off because then uh, Avaya can push harder when they're moving more uh, accurately and therefore they top the podium. Obviously, there are other criteria that lead to their success as well. But, you know, in terms of sleep strategy, they play conservative and it pays off and they move faster overall. So it's not necessarily a bad idea to get some sleep even on the first night of an expedition length race. Then the question becomes, how do you take that sleep? And it can be quite beneficial to pretty much like if you're in the army, you know, every opportunity that arises, you want to grab those few Zs is to do exactly that. And that's been the approach with the teams that I've raced with in the past. So if somebody, if you're out on the stage, uh, somebody uh, needs to check the map for a few minutes, that's enough for me to lie down and go to sleep. If somebody's repairing their feet or somebody needs to go to the toilet, maybe they've got explosive diarrhea or something terrible, um, or somebody needs to go fetch something, I don't know, whatever it is, I'm going to lie down and catch some sleep if uh, you know, I'm not busy navigating or something like that. So um, the point is over the length of the race, that's going to accumulate and overall you will have had quite a bit of sleep by the end of the race. In terms of disciplines, um, obviously on a trekking stage, it's going to be pretty hard to sleep because the rest of the team's moving, you can't just lie down. Um, on a biking stage, obviously it can be pretty much hazardous to go to sleep on a bike. Um, but when it comes to kayaking or paddling stages, as you can imagine, quite often you're in a two-person kayak or canoe and you can take turns to sleep. In fact, I know some people who, as soon as they get into a kayak, because kayaking tends to be rather monotonous, especially on flat water, um, they almost induce to sleep straight away. But the point is, you know, at least in a kayak, one of your team members can be paddling while the other person is sleeping. And you might just, you know, take turns. You say, I'm going to sleep for the next half hour, you just take over. At least the team is still making forward progress, um, not as fast as it would be if, if both team members would be paddling, but at least there is some benefit there, some opportunity to sleep. And I've seen some teams in whitewater rafting because um, in some races it's mandatory to have a whitewater guide in the, white, in the raft with you. So even the entire team will turn around to the guide, who's doing all the steering of course, and say to the guide, listen, you just get us down the whitewater, the whole lot of us are going to sleep because we need it. And you'll see this raft heading down the river, one person at the back, the rest of the team completely flaked out. So, you know, grab sleep whenever you can. Um, I've slept in all sorts of crazy places. I got some good sleep in an ATM, in fact. Me and my teammates locked ourselves in and went to sleep. I don't know what time in the morning it was, but it was warm, it was comfortable, relatively speaking. And, uh, you know, it was out of the wind, out of the elements. And, and then it comes, how long should you sleep for? And the research seems to show that if you sleep in 15 minute intervals, it's the most beneficial because it gives you enough time to get into deeper sleep, literally, in that short amount of time, and then you start coming back out of it. So 15 minutes or increments of that, so half an hour, 45 minutes, a uh, full hour, um, it seems to work better. So, you know, I'm going to go with the research. Although having said that, one of the best sleeps I can remember was on the second day of uh, a 50-hour race. Um, and we've been going since the previous morning, many disciplines, fast race. We were, we were exhausted by the second day, mid-afternoon, and uh, we just completed a really hectic stage. And so it was blazing sunshine. So again, no sleeping bags, no tent. We could just lie down in the middle of a forest. And we set our watches for a nine-minute alarm. And it was amazing how after nine minutes, literally, alarms go off, get up, let's move. We felt so refreshed. I know it's not a 15 minute interval, but the point is even for nine minutes, um, we still, all of us in that team, remember how incredible it was, what a difference it made to, to our energy levels. Um, in a 60 hour race that I did with some of the same team members, um, in the 60 hour, or 55, 60 hours, I don't know what it was, um, the cumulative sleep that we had amounted to uh, less than an hour. So on the second day, we didn't sleep in the first night, on the second day we spent 20 minutes in transition before we got into our bikes, just lay down on the grass, went to sleep, no sleeping bags or anything. Great, you know, then onto the biking stage off we went. And then on a uh, subsequent morning we had a sleep in, an, in a lavender field. There used to be lavender there, but there was still the smell of lavender, some flowers around. And we just lay down on, the, on this dirt and we all went to sleep, I think it was 10, 15 minutes.
woke up and headed off and we did really well in the race. So, you know, um, something that's really critical for you as especially an inexperienced adventure racer is to get experience with sleep deprivation. So make sure before you participate in any race that's 24 hours or longer that you've already done at least 24 hours in your training in a single go. So going through that unknown, going through the night and into the morning and still pushing is quite an educational experience and will give you confidence for when you actually have to deal with that in the race itself. So really you want to practice that sleep deprivation as part of your training. Um, I also remember in one event, um, my teammate and I were, were really wasted, a four-man team, and Andy and I, we were exhausted, and we could sleep anywhere, anytime. And we were on a, a mountain road, a kind of deserted mountain road in the middle of nowhere. And uh, Ross, he's a really good navigator, really huge endurance. Um, he was doing the navigating, and he stopped to check the map, and we just lay down on the tarmac and went lights out, middle of the road. But, you know, there's no traffic or anything, so just go to sleep. And uh, it turned out in the middle of the night that a car came along. Mind you, we'd only been lying on the, on the tarp, you know, for a few minutes. After all that, a, a car came along these curves along this deserted road. And it came around the corner and picked up our two bodies lying in the middle of the tarmac. And the driver must have maybe panicked and thought there had been an accident or something. So he slammed on the brakes and smashed into the guardrail on the side of the road. And, you know, he's leaning out the window saying, oh, are you, what's happened? Are you all right? All right. And Ross had to, to go to them and say, sorry, sorry. No, no, no. There's nothing wrong with them. They're just sleeping. They're just tired. And the driver didn't even check his car. He just said, oh, okay. <laughs> and, you know, foot to the, the, the floor, wheels squealing, and off we went back up the road. It was really quite funny. But, you know, sleeping on tarmac, sleeping on, on rough ground, on gravel, on rocks, uh, you won't believe how you can adapt when you're tired enough. You know, it'll make, what you're sleeping on will make absolutely no difference. Even in the rain, you will just be lights out. Now, one of the worst cases of sleep deprivation, though, that I've ever seen was in the 2013 Adventure Racing World Championships in Costa Rica. It's a legendary race, a very, very tough race. And Seagate was leading and was expected to win the race. And, you know, obviously the teams pursuing them were really keen to, to try and beat Seagate and were pushing themselves extremely hard. And the second to last stage was a 60 kilometer paddle on a canal parallel to the sea, which was incredibly boring. Straight line. I mean, I would hate to do that. Anyway, so Seagate got to the end of that, got out of their inflatable uh, canoes or kayaks, and they discovered that their feet had picked up a terrible jungle rot of some kind. So at that last transition, before the final stage, they had to pull out because they, they couldn't literally put their feet on, on, on the ground. That hurt so much. They had to be carried. And eventually, I think, I think they went straight to hospital. So they pulled out, and the team that was pursuing them, I was close behind, was Team uh, Tully um, with Jackie Bosset and uh, Miriam Gio, uh, husband and wife, um, really famous in adventure racing uh, circles. Uh, they're now in Spartan Race, I think. Anyway, they had been pushing so hard to try to keep up with Seagate um, that they got into the final bike stage and they ended up crossing the finishing line in first place. So they did win the World Championships. But as they were finishing that stage, uh, Jackie's condition had deteriorated massively and it became a real thing. Would they manage to finish? And it was like, there was a little kind of, I think there was a little zip line to, you know, in that bike stage. And then actually there was some, I think there was actually some whitewater rafting at the very, very end. Yeah, okay, whatever. The point is they were so exhausted. He was so exhausted and he looked, he was glazed. And, you know, the, the race staff, the spectators, uh, dot watchers, all of us were alarmed at his state. You know, you could, you could push yourself so hard through lack of sleep, you could suffer a heart attack potentially, you know, um, have a stroke or something. So there was massive concern for his well-being. In hindsight, maybe he shouldn't have pushed himself that hard, although he did recover. Although that was back in 2013, and he can correct me if, he's, if I'm wrong, but I don't think he's done an adventure race since then. But, you know, that was pushing too hard. And, you know, the winning team, I think the, Tully's finishing time was something like, you know, 150 hours or something on, you know, maybe a handful of hours of sleep. So, yeah, you don't, you don't want to push yourself too far. Um, and as a, as a, if you're uh, an experienced team, certainly... Um, you know, it's more about trying to finish the race than trying to push yourself 
to the end just in order to get a certain position. Okay, and then sleep monsters. You know, what does it mean? What are those things other than uh, the name of the best adventure racing website on the internet? Um, ha ha ha. Um, yeah, sleep monsters are the hallucinations you experience due to sleep deprivation. And especially in something like adventure racing where you're pushing yourself hard, so you're exhausted potentially, and therefore the sleep deprivation you know, hits you even worse than if you were just doing some sort of marathon watching box sets from the comfort of your couch. So I'll just say to, to people who haven't experienced it before, sleep monsters are nothing to worry about. Um, they come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, my personal experience, uh, I can remember one, on one occasion I was going down a road in the middle of the day, so bright sunshine, casting shadows across the road with the trees that were lining this particular tarmac road. And in my mind, those shadows from the trees were gates, were farm gates that I had to climb over. So my teammate ahead of me, wanted, you know, he was fine, he was moving. And I was going very slowly and then trying to climb over, you know, waist high gates that didn't exist. Or especially at night when I've got a head torch, um, as you move, your head torch, you know, the shadows shift and, and move with the movement of the torch. Um, and so in my experience, they, those shadows on the ground turn into living creatures like gargoyles or monsters or I don't know, I can't, you know, toads or whatever they are. Um, so they're not, they're not threatening or anything. I, I, I've yet to hear of anybody who's had sleep monsters that have been uh, nightmarish, but um, it's, it's quite common for people to experience even conversations with people who don't exist. So, you know, talking to Elvis, having a discussion with, you know, Bugs Bunny and over there is the Dalai Lama. Um, I haven't experienced that yet. You might even find that, you, you, you know, you're, you're doing fine and you hear a teammate talking and you turn around, you know, what are they saying to you? And you discover they're not talking to anybody. They're talking to somebody that doesn't exist. Or people will see lights and that'll be a hotel and, you know, they really want to sleep. And so they, they, they literally think there's a hotel in the middle of the desert, in the middle of the jungle. You know, we've got to go to the hotel. We've got to lay down. <laughs> um, so, yeah, sleep monsters are nothing to worry about. Um, I find them highly amusing, in fact. And you will, experiencing, you will experience them if you, you know, enter a hard race and, and, and push yourself. So, um, yeah, it's, it's nothing to worry about. And if... You're unlikely to experience it, I suppose, on something 24 hours or less, but, you know, they will come along and uh, make friends with them. And one last thing to finish on, the sleep you will experience during a long adventure race will be some of the most intense, blissful, deepest sleep you will ever experience. Trust me, uh, you speak to anybody who's been doing it for a while, they will agree with that. Um, and not only during the race, but after the race. And it's, it's the fantasy sleep that people write books about, you know, the ability to put your head in the pillow, instantly lights out, and then when you wake up, no dreams, you just wake up completely refreshed. You will experience that in a, a longer race, and it will be all of 15 minutes long, and yet be incredible. Um, and then after the race, of course, you will sleep like a log. It is beautiful. Uh, it's one of the things I really look forward to, in fact, um, for uh, longer adventure races. All right. Hopefully this has been useful. Thanks for watching. Shout out to my patrons. Uh, thank you very much. Your support's really appreciated. And thank you to everybody who's been, uh, you know, watching these episodes and contributing with ideas and things. Yes, I will get around to producing an episode on foot care. It just takes a while to put that one together for various reasons, as you'll see uh, when I put it out there. But yeah, thanks very much. And I'll see you on the next one. Cheers.